Welcome back everyone to the channel. Thanks for watching. We're answering questions again from inside the Weld app. Today's question comes from Kenny E196 from Georgia. Hey guys, hope everyone's doing well. They're just getting started in their welding career and they're starting to get a little comfortable, but now they're running into the 4F7018 overhead weld position and they're asking for so many tips. I've got five great ones for you. Great fundamentals. If you don't follow these five, you're gonna mess up this weld every time. Now let's set up a weld test situation. We've got welder A and we've got welder B. We're gonna put them through the exact same weld test. They're gonna be running the exact same machine, the exact same electrode, 332, 7018, and we're gonna be running the exact same amperage the entire way through, 90 amps, and only using a wire wheel to clean. So no grinding is going to be done, no fixing, just covering up all the boo-boos. Now welder A is gonna be doing everything fundamentally correct. Now, welder B, on the other hand, is gonna be doing a lot of fundamental things completely wrong. Follow these five steps, and I guarantee you, you'll be doing just hunky-dory in the 4F position. Step one to mastering your 4F weld is gonna be your body positioning and your coupon position. When learning, it doesn't have to be too high or too tall, man, get it just right just for you, just your height, and also find something to rest on. Follow those ABCs. We can see Welder B here trying to look cool for the gram. He's got none of his body positioning correct. I like putting my elbow up on something to help brace myself using two hands. I don't like necessarily putting the elbow up, but more the backside of my arm, so I still have more control over where my arms are going, as well as not having that coupon too high, but right at eye level so that you can see your welds more clear and do some practicing on some dry runs to make sure that you know where your hands are going to end up, where they're going to be, and then you know that you're in a comfy spot. A lot of these issues that you're gonna have as far as welding this 4F position has to do with your body positioning. If you mess up your body positioning, it's likely that you're gonna get these other things wrong too. Welder A on the other hand, it's got everything under control, looks real comfortable, it's letting the rod do all the work for him. Welder A's first pass, not too shabby. You know, it's a little shaky hands just to get the rhythm going again. But Welder B, on the other hand, has way more problems. Tie-in issues, undercut, trap slag, the whole nine yards is stuck in this weld just from not being comfortable. Step two, guys, that's going to be all about our rod angle. Now, I'm not talking about the travel angle. We're going to be pretty much carrying a drag the whole time. We might get a little bit straight on with it, but that's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Even maybe a little bit of a push, but I'm talking about that work angle. People always tend to have the sight lines looking this way. They don't want to look up. They don't want to get down or uncomfortable. So they always miss this top and they don't have that right rod angle because they're just not looking right. Now, in theory, for our rod angle, the correct way is really got to do with these lines of sight. Right? If you're sitting with your eyes up here, you're not really seeing all that's going on on this top plate. You're actually wanting to look at more of this and not really realizing that you're not aiming up here enough. So that's why we got to drop our head down and have better line of sight up in there so that we know we can get those top beads and not have uneven legs. If we're looking at it correct, these distances from here to here is the legs should be the same. But if we're only looking at this bottom plate, then our leg tends to be a lot longer than it is up here. The beads are kind of where they need to be, but we're still favoring this bottom plate a lot more, and I see this a lot. So we wanna make sure that our rod angle changes, but we have a good line of sight, and anytime we're at this top plate, we're pointing at that top plate, making it that overhead weld. These angles change depending on which bead you're doing, but if we're only really favoring this angle here, looking at it the way we are, all of our aiming is all kind of one direction. So you need to be able to see, that'll help your rod angle. As you can see here, from having the right rod angle, you're gonna be able to favor that top plate a lot more than the bottom. And you'll be able to split the difference a lot better having even legs and being able to fill in the top plate, avoiding undercut and trap slag. Step three guys, is all about your tie-ins and your travel speed. Tie-ins are really frustrating to get going and start learning and especially overhead. And that overhead is uncomfortable. People tend to weld too fast. They get want to get out of there. They're uncomfortable. They want to stop. They just weld too quick. And it's just not going to work out that way for you. You're going to make a bad weld. Tie-ins and travel speed with the 7018 are real simple. Okay. It's all about striking up ahead of the puddle. This is our previous weld. We've got our little crater here. We've got our rod. We're going to strike up somewhere around an inch. An inch is plenty. 
a little bit closer, you're kind of risking it, not having enough time for this rod to preheat. It's got to get a little warm before it can form and establish a puddle. So that's one reason why we strike ahead. Also, when you strike an arc, you always pretty much long arc it. You strike up, you pop back up, and in this time of you popping back up and coming back down to come back, you drop a lot of stuff right here. A lot of boo-boo, bloody, bloody boo, boo-boo, poo-poo, whatever. All right? So when you come back and you trace this crater, you watch that puddle, trace that crater, and then you just come back nice and slow and steady. Okay, and in that time, all this will burn out. Now, if you do something wrong and you strike up right here, you put all that boo doo boo all right here, all that dookie, and you have a real cold start because this rod doesn't have time to preheat, and then you're off to the races and now you got a good weld. But this is full of junk. It's got porosity and other bad stuff in it. As far as travel speed, you also want to maintain that nice, constant, slow travel speed. Okay, that's it. You just need to be nice, slow, and steady. If you're too fast, you'll have a weld that has uneven toes, or if you're inconsistent, you, you gotta have a nice, slow, steady travel speed in order to weld with these 7018s. More metal with the 7018, probably the faster you can go, this rod size does matter when it comes to that travel speed. Now you can tell from looking at these welds that Welder A still is working out the shakes, but the tie-ins are nice and smooth and blended. Whereas Welder B, on the other hand, we've got cold starts and we've got a bunch of clustered porosity right on the starts, which is super gnarly. And welding too fast makes that slag really hard to get off. If you just slow and steady, that slag comes right off. Step four is all about bead placement. Now I'm talking about where we're putting that bead. Everyone always wants to favor this plate where they stock that first bead down too low. Gotta set yourself up for success and put that bead in the right spot. Not too low, not too high, or you're gonna have weird valleys or chunky looking welds. In theory, bead placement, if we think about it almost like the rod angle where we're favoring this plate too much, we're actually got our rod angle correct. We're pointing the right places. We're just not pointing that bead in the right place. So this will be our correct one. This is incorrect. We'll just do I and C for incorrect. So bead placement here, we're really trying to get right into that 45 holding both sides even. We've got to have even legs for every bead. Okay, so we're going to continue to do that. And really, you're getting past this halfway point. Like if you're if you're really aiming for this halfway, you're going to end up being a, maybe a hair too low. You've got to try to get the top toe of this next well just a hair over halfway. So a hair over halfway, then you can just really point up there with the right rod angle to make sure that you get that effective throat through there and you make that triangle. Same thing with these next beads. If this is the center well, you're really, really trying your best to get to that point. You might even have to carry some bigger welds at this point. And then going over there and making sure that you have the right rod angle to again, form that perfect, effective throat, actual throat, all of the in-betweens. Whereas this incorrect rod angle we typically start because of gravity and again, the eye, the line of sight, you always want to start that B almost incorrect right off the jump. So we got a smaller leg length already with the first weld. We're looking at it this way. So we're, we're doing it again, but instead of really trying to get that bead to go up past halfway or even further at this point to try to correct this, we aim low and now we really have a long leg up here and by the time we're like, oh crap, I need to catch up. So I'm going to go fix my rod angle, make sure I'm up there to get the right legs. Now I've got a valley, I've got a dip, I've got a, a low spot in there, not getting that effective throat. So that's why it's important to always have the right bead placement. And if we continue this and put that bead again lower when it's supposed to be, and then now we're like, oh man, I can't stretch these three beads when you should be able to. And now you have these valleys that are no bueno. This throat is all shallow, it's concave. We don't want to have that. We want to try to have this nice flush or if anything, just a little bit of a crown on it. Bead placement is absolutely crucial when you're checking out these welds. It's going to help prevent a lot of overlap issues or leaving deep valleys in between your welds, which can cause a lot of stress risers or weak points in your weld. So you want to make sure everything has the right size and effective throw across the entire plate. Whereas on the welder B side, we've got valleys in between the welds and they're spread out. The leg links are bad. There's valleys and towards the end, you start seeing it that they start getting clustered up and in a bulk and they've even missed the top plate. So bead placement 
alignment and planning your weld is absolutely crucial. And again, looking at weld size, you can tell the difference clear as day between these two welds. Welder A, we've got a nice filled in fillet weld, where you can see welder B is way slanted and way favoring the bottom plate. Step five is all about arcling. Gravity, it gets you tired, especially after a long day or welding a bunch of coupons, doing it one after the other constantly, that arm gets tired and your arcling pulls away, back in, pulls away, back in. We've got to get a handle on that arcling because it could cause a whole lot of other issues. Now looking at welder B, we can see that the arc length is inconsistent. It's sped up on the left side. You can see how shaky the hand is and it keeps dropping in and out. But on the right side, that weld is close then far away, close then far away, close and far away. He's in and out of his puddle and it's just no good. You're gonna get a bunch of porosity this way, undercut and a bunch of issues. And then you got welder A over here. He posted up like a stop sign, super comfortable up against the pole, which is able for him to keep his hands up nice and steady, keeping that consistent control over their arc length so as not to change up that puddle, but giving the nice consistent bead profile all the way across. Oh, and I'll leave you guys with a pro tip too, all about 4F welding overhead. You gotta have some good PPE. You want a good solid shirt, you're gonna have big BBs dropping on you, maybe not for the 332nd, 7018, but definitely with a 18, 6010s, you gotta have the right gear, have the right gloves. These are thinner for some people, right? But if you get you know a little bit more experience, you'll know where not to put your hands and burn them up. You want that nice welding cap, you want those safety glasses. You gotta have all these PPE pieces in order to make a good weld so you don't burn yourself up and have to stop man staying covered may be hot but it really keeps you with the weld looking you boys all finished up right on well uh i'll call up the inspector right now and get him over here weld inspector here I'm here to look at some welds let's take our first look at welder b we have some severe undercut right here no arc marks outside the bevel we have a valley right through here and through here now we also have small start little overlap issues here and here we also see some slag undercut more slag lack of fusion undercut uneven legs weld size is off we're too far on the bottom edge of this weld a lot of stuff wrong here with welder b looking at welder a it's showing a lot more promise we have a nice weld size here we've got nice even legs throughout could improve a little bit this size is a little bit bigger than this if i had to be picky which i'm always picky might even have a little bit of a valley right here but i think it'll oh arc marks what is that take that flashlight and we've got a little bit of undercut right here that right there it's there <laughs> i never miss a thing well, that concludes my inspection. Welder A, good to go. He needs a little bit of work though. <laughs> now, as far as welder B, send him pack it. That dude was weird. Now I wanna make this really abundantly clear. This isn't one of those situations where it's like, what's my weld worth an hour or what's my hourly rate for this type of weld? One welder got the job, one welder didn't. What? Welder A, hired. Welder B, you gotta start over again. And it comes down to just quality of the situation. Welder B did not follow these fundamentals right. They got undercut, we got trap porosity. I know there's slag in there, the leg lengths, the weld size, it's all uneven, it's all wrong. And even though you might get a decent grade in weld school for it, or at least get a passing grade, it's not what's gonna get you a job. So welder A even had an arc strike and a little bit of undercut that could be rejectable under some codes. And you might, well, that was a good weld. Well, it could still be rejectable. You've got to make sure that you're practicing these fundamentals. There is no shortage of welders out there, guys. There's only a shortage of quality. I hope that helped answer your question, Kenny. If you guys have any other questions about anything else that I can even try to answer or someone else in that app is going to answer it, guys. See you on the next one. Thanks for watching.